So, I mean, we had quite a, a brief previous speaker. Um, I think this talk is, uh, is similar. Um, it started a bit earlier. It's about um, macroscopic superpositions. And uh, we proposed to do an experiment with a superposition of a mirror. And uh, I think the previous speaker said that there was an undergraduate coming to him saying, this is a great thing you should be doing. I had a similar experience, but it was Roger Penrose. Um, he actually walked in the lab and said, um, I, I, I was a postdoc. My first postdoc was with Roger Penrose on theory. Then I was a postdoc with Anton Seininger on, on uh, quantum entanglement. Then I went back to Oxford, started a an, an laboratory there. And then he, he, this was the day that he literally walked in the lab and said, I have an idea for an experiment. And um, he started talking about satellites and things. And, and we said, OK, calm down. Um, let's see if we can do something on uh, an optical table. So we wrote a letter together with uh, Will Marshall and Crystal Simon on towards a quantum superposition of a mirror. And if uh, Roger Penrose give a talk on, on these ideas, he, so he claims that, or he, he suggests, he proposes that quantum mechanics and general relativity, if you combine them, gives a solution for the quantum state reduction, uh, the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. And very, very briefly, he says, if you have a superposition of a mass here and being there, then there is a sort of self-energy, a self-gravitational energy. And this gives you, um, if you want to make the superposition, you have to have this extra energy. And therefore, if you do the uncertainty relation between energy and, and time, you, if you need a large amount of energy, if the masses are large, the, the time that you can have this superposition is ex extremely small. So I will explain that in more detail, but when he uh, gave uh, this presentation and he gave a talk at uh, UC Santa Barbara with a uh, very well distinguished uh, theorist, uh, David Gross was there, uh, uh, Jim Hartle, other uh, extremely good theorists, and for example, David Gross was just sitting there. Yeah. <laughs> now that, that's, I think, a typical attitude. But uh, I, 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 got, I got worried about this. So I asked them, what, what is their main concern? And the main concern is, he said, if you take, two electro if you take an electron, you put it in a superposition. Nobody would calculate the self-electrostatic interaction that would just fly apart. So why do it for gravitational uh, effects? So the only answer that Penrose gives is gravity is something very different. OK, so having worked with him for a little while, I know where this statement comes from. So the first five to 10 minutes, I will say a few words where that comes from. Um, and so Roger Penrose should be known for his twister theory. That's his main thing, not the books that he wrote, not the prediction that he made. Twister theory is really um, his thing. And, um, Twister theory is a theory in which you don't use x, y, z, and t as the coordinates in which you describe all of physics, but you use a four-dimensional complex space. They um, they're represent not a four vector, but a twister. So a twister represents these coordinates. And in terms of twisters, you can rederive or re-express all of physics. And if you look for certain solutions of, say, the Maxwell equation, you get very beautiful solutions as the most element elementary solutions. So a few words about twister theory. It starts with understanding or using spinner notation. And spinner notation, so if you were to start with a four vector, so time, three space coordinates, then there is a beautiful way of writing it in a, in a two by two matrix form, if you wish. Right? You recognize the identity times time plus the three Pauli matrices times x, y, z, and t. So if this determinant, uh, if you calculate, you will find that it's t squared minus the space coordinates squared. So that is the four interval. And that's actually um, a, a unique way. You get automatically one time and three space coordinates if you try to condense the information in a four vector in a two by two matrix. So that, that's already pretty, that you sort of naturally see that you get one time three space coordinates, which is a major question in nature. Why do we have 
those coordinates. Okay. Now, if you then want to do a Lorentz transformation, you simply have to preserve the determinant. So that means you have a, a, a linear two by two matrix with complex elements, and you have to preserve the determinant. So it's it is a special Lorentz transformation, right? So if you apply that to this two by two matrix, then you get a new two by two matrix, which will give a Lorentz transformation. So the, these transformations, SL2C, gives you the Lorentz group, and it's a two to one isomorphism, uh, which means that. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I was going to put the first slide no, yeah. but then I thought yes, it's a bit too rude. <laughs> And then I thought, but that would get more root, no snoring either. <laughs> but I waited till he kindly was out of the room. This is taped, right? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, so this is a two to one isomorphism. So a Lorentz, trans a Lorentz boost, which would just be uh, concerning the, the, the time and z coordinate, is simply represented by this transformation. And uh, a rotation in space in the xy plane would be uh, this rotation. And um, so here you already see something else that is very pretty about this uh, construction is that you have to rotate over four pi in order to get the identity back in SL2C. So rotation over two pi gives you a, a minus sign uh, in SL2C. Um, now, of course, it does because the, the, you have the matrix on, on both sides in your transformation, this minus sign cancels. But if we use this notation acting on what we call spinors in a minute, then this minus sign becomes scientifically significant. So by just going to a different way of dealing with these four vectors, you get the, the space-time structure and you get um, intrinsic fermionic properties. Okay. Now, if I look at only null um, or at, at geodesic, so um, space-time vectors that correspond to uh, uh, a light signal, then um, this determinant has to be uh, zero. And then you can write down this matrix in a simplified form as a spinor times its, its complex conjugate spinor. Yeah? So, for those spinors, the transformations really gives you, if you rotate over 2 pi, you introduce a minus sign, okay? But this notation at the same time tells you that an overall phase vector <laughs> is cancelled. So the spinor notation is somewhat um, overdetermined to represent uh, space-time points. So in that sense, it, I'm, I'm very loosely speaking, in that sense, you bring in room to have phase freedom in your definition of space-time, as well as intrinsic um, fermionic properties. Okay. Now, what is a twister? A twister is nothing else than two spinors, and this uh, defined in, in such a way. And um, so, a set of two spinors is uh, a twister, and in twister coordinates, you can uh, rederive physics. Now, to get an idea what a twister is. Um, we look at this uh, definition, which is called the twister equation. There you see the two uh, spinors and a space-time dependent. So what this is, it defines a spinor, uh, a spinor field in Minkowski space. And if I set this, equ this equation equal to zero, these are two um, complex numbers, these are two complex numbers, then I find uh, a plane in the complex Minkowski space that solves this equation. Yeah? So if I put this equal to zero, I get a plane in complexified Minkowski space where you can solve this. And if this plane intersects with the real Minkowski space, that line represents a light ray. So we now have the, as a coordinate is, would be a twister. If this twister is null, in real space it, co it corresponds to a light ray. And um, if you take all these light rays, you can uh, recompose um, a space-time. For example, if you want to describe a point in real space, you must take all the light rays that intersect that point. Yeah. Now, you could also ask, what would, 
what should we think of, uh, of a twister that doesn't represent a plane that crosses the real Minkowski space? And that is a non-null twister. And what you could do is you could take the planes in complexified Minkowski space that are orthogonal to that plane and do cut through the real Minkowski space. And those planes represent a light ray. So the sets of light rays corresponding to the planes that cross, that are orthogonal to this non-null twister, you can make a picture of it. And um, the picture looks like this. So um, you should see this vector. Uh, it, it's a time uh, a snapshot, say at t is zero. Then an arrow here would represent a light ray going this direction. And that would represent one of the null twisters that is orthogonal to the non-null twister. And if you collect all these sets, you get this linked structure of, of lines that propagates along the z direction. <coughs> and this is called the Robinson congruence. Okay. Now, I'm particularly interested in this as well because together with my colleague, William Irvin, we actually showed that there are solutions of Maxwell's equations that have exactly the same structure. And very recently, we, we proved that they are the same. Um, they, they are one-to-one -one related to each other. Um, but that's not what I will talk about. What I have hoped to say now is that in twister theory, first of all, space-time, uh, or yeah, the, the idea of twister theory is that space-time is a secondary concept <coughs> and has sort of naturally three space, one time coordinate. It has intrinsic fermionic, fermionic properties. And most important for Penrose, it has intrinsic quantum mechanical properties. And then those are more technical things, what follows from twister theory. So for Penrose, it's obvious, with, with all his work, that relativity and quantum mechanics are already in one frame. On top of that, you can start describing charged particles moving. So I think this would be the answer if at the end of the talk he would have the time to explain why general relativity um, or why his arguments apply for massive objects and not for charged objects. Okay, all right. So I'll come back to Penrose's arguments uh, in a few minutes. So now let's go back to standard quantum mechanics. Um, and then uh, the issues are of course related to the quantum mechanical wave function. What do we really learn by knowing the quantum mechanical wave function? Um, and ac according to Niels Bohr, the wave function describes what we know about the system and what we can predict with this information. And we shouldn't give it too much physical uh, reality. Okay, so that's one, one interpretation. And you can come a long, long way with this you can explain perfectly well why um, we don't observe superpositions of ma uh, macroscopic objects. Because there is a process, environmental induced decoherence, by which if an object gets larger, it starts getting coupled to the environment. The coupling to the environment leads to entanglement with degrees of freedom in the environment. And if you try to do an interference experiment, which is your only way of testing that you have a superposition, then if you do that on one part of an entangled state, you will have no interference. You must interfere all the states, all the entangled states, in order to get interference back. So you can calculate for all systems that we have investigated how long it takes for the coherences in the subsystem that you're interested in to decay in, um, in a statistical stochastical way by coupling to the environment. And in, in uh, technical terms, you just have the density matrix, all kind of off diagonal elements for the correlations. They sort of, if you take the full system into account, they wash out and you only end up with the diagonal uh, components on the reduced density of the system that you are doing measurements on. And then you're back to a, to a description that is identical to a classical di uh, distribution. So in that sense, you can perfectly well describe how statistical predictions follow from quantum mechanics. Um, but from a fundamental level, you still started with the superposition. And the superposition is preserved in all the, all the uh, correlations um, that are now uh, entangled with the environment. Okay. 
So, what if we were to take this wave function more serious and really give it some physical uh, reality and uh, Everett uh, was, I think, the one that proposes that. Uh, I think after his PhD he went into uh, financial uh, things. Uh, um, uh, another character that is a strong advocate of this uh, theory is, is David Deutz. Uh, I met him a few times in Oxford. Also quite a character. Um, this many worlds interpretation, I think the best way to, um, yeah, so if, if in discussions again with people at, at UCSB, for example, in particular Jim Hartle, I once asked him what he thought about this and to my surprise his, his answer was obviously that's the only proper way of thinking about it because um, it all matters where you put the boundaries of your experiment. And um, if, we for, if we assume that there are no observers looking at the universe, then we still have all the correlations in the wave function of the universe. So the concept of decoherence is simply your notion of this is the system I discuss and decoherence is what happens to that particular system. And then you can loosely talk about it, but it's not a fundamental property. And if that's not the case, then all correlations do um, exist and the many worlds interpretation is is not so crazy um, so when I met there was in some on the way to some conference in in China on a bus I met Le Feidman I knew him f earlier uh, before from from Oxford and he was obviously in a, in a quite excited state he was irritated and, and he, he was applying for a patent and he didn't get it through so I asked him, what, what is it about? And he said, well, I, I propose a watch that has a single photon source, a beam splitter, two detectors, single photon detectors. And if I have to make a difficult decision in life, I said, okay, what the hell? And I asked my watch what to do, right? If this watch says, don't do it, I don't do it. If the watch said, do it, I do it. If it goes wrong, I know at least in the other universe. <laughs> it was just... <laughs> and he said, just wait, just wait 20 more years and everyone will buy this watch. <laughs> and I'm not so sure. Anyway, but then I knew, then I realized this is, this is a true many worlds believer. And um, this is the way to think about it. And it's of course nothing else than Schrodinger's cat, but um, this is what quantum mechanics tells you without any addition to quantum mechanics. Tel Aviv University. Okay. More comments left about Lev Feitman? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Lev. I'm not sure. He's probably not, not, not watching. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember the first time I met Lev Feitman was actually in an office in, in Oxford. He was a visiting professor and I gave him a desk in my office, which was fine. So he was sitting there. He didn't introduce himself. And I was at my desk and a student came and he was working with Chris Isham on consistent histories. So he started talking about it and left turns around. Who would work on consistent histories? And then it just continued working again. <laughs> so he is quite outspoken, but, but normally right, actually. Um, okay, so what does Penrose says? He said, well, okay, you're taking quantum mechanics way too far. You're pushing quantum mechanics beyond boundaries that we haven't investigated at all. And um, there's a good reason why macroscopic objects will not be observed, will not be able to be in a quantum superposition. And um, so he, he says, he points out that there is a, a, a conflict between Einstein's general covariance principle and quantum superposition principle. And it's, it's quite easy to see. If you take an object in, in, a, in a state psi, then this is the Schrodinger equation that you have to solve. If the object is massive, then it determines the space-time structure in the region where this object is. And it also determines what you take as your uh, time derivative. So if you take the same object in a different place, whatever that means general in, in a relativistic way, you, you end up considering a different um, time derivative operator. So there's an uncertainty or there's, you're using two different time derivatives and that an uncertainty in that time derivative should lead 
or should be equivalent to an uncertainty in, in energy. Yeah. So the, the, the question is, if you are in this case, so it's obvious that we're dealing with two different space-time structures, what, would we what do we have to say about the superposition? And as I said, if you have to find one way out, and there is, he doesn't have a clear theory what should happen, what the interactions will be, but he says if you try to have the superposition, then you basically can calculate what would happen if you have a test particle if you say you have two different, the, the masses is in two different places, then you somehow must identify the two spaces and that you can do with the boundaries of your experiment. So you could say I start with one point which is the same for the two different space-time structures. I have a test particle of unit mass propagating through that device and if the two masses represents different space-time curvature, you get different curvature, you get different tra trajectories for these particles. And you can, um, the, 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 the value for the difference in, in energy associated to the states is proposed to be F minus F prime squared, where F represents the, the gravitational forces per unit test mass if the mass is on one place, and F prime if the mass is on the other place. So that, that is how you calculate the self um, energy. Yeah? That's what is proposed. And there's hardly, it's, it's hard to find another quantity that represents energy um, and is directly related with the, the gravitational potentials. Okay. This is just a postulate of his. It doesn't, this is, it can't be derived from the normal definition of classical self energy, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. This is not so an self energy in, in the, in the, the standard sense. Yeah. No, not okay. at all. Okay. No. So once you have this notion that if you insist by an experimental configuration to put a, a massive object in two places, you sort of get a blister in space-time that requires energy, and that is allowed only for a short amount of time. And, um, so, uh, I don't mean to berate it, but he's, he's trying to grab a piece of future theory that doesn't exist, that has plausibility, bring it back here and make the quantum mechanical connection. If, if you, yes, and, but he has... I mean, he a, doesn't have a twister calculation. No, the, okay. no, no, no. But he, he has this idea that, has that, that this should be connected. So he makes a leap from where his theory is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so in, in, in very crude ways, this is the picture. You have a curvature there. The, you try to put a superposition of that. You get a, an, an energy a self-energy that represents the extra energy needed in space-time to get this blister in space-time, and that is allowed to exist for delta t uh, if it's of the order of, of h bar. Okay. Yeah. So then you can actually do these calculations, and um, there are different ways of doing these calculations, but for the systems that we will be interested in, we have a mass of, of 10 to the minus 12 kilograms. We are talking about uh, resonators of, of 10 kilohertz. Um, so then there is the issue, if you have a piece of metal, uh, a material, and I try to or put it in a superposition, then if I were to take this piece of material to be made up of point particles, delta functions, at the positions of the atom, then the tiniest displacement would have this self-energy um, explode. So you cannot take point particles as absolute point particles. So then the question is, what is the size that you have to put in in this calculation? Do we have to take the size of the uh, nuclei or do we have to take the size of the wave packet associated to the whole mass? And that leads to um, different predictions. And for example, for if, if we take the mass of the nucleus, then for these objects that we will discuss in a minute, the decoherence time is about a millisecond. If we take the ground state wave packet of these objects, uh, which are larger, um, we would be uh, able to have decoherence times of the order of a second. If you do the same calculation for C60 uh, molecules, the do decoherence time is about 10 to the 10 seconds. So for all experiments, to date, 
the times that the decoherence is allowed according to this calculation is, is much, much longer than the actual time that these experiments took place. And actually, uh, very recently, there were two experiments, also one from UCSB and, and one from Caltech, where they use high frequency resonators and put, put them in superpositions and actually demonstrate that these superpositions persist over one period of oscillation. Now to do those experiments, they deliberately went to very high frequency resonators. Um, the experiments at UCB had only low quality factors and it turns out that the decoherence times that they should have for those systems are still about se six orders of magnitude larger than the time they can do these measurements. So uh, it's surprising that a lot of progress towards those experiments are currently being made. And in fact, when we started this experiment um, in, in 2003 or something, I thought I was the only crazy person like you, with all respect, that would start out on something like that. But by now, there are at least 10 groups in the world that try to do these experiments. Um, so, um, so anyway, there's, there are many steps being made recently, and um, I think it will not take too long before we can truly test these gravitation-induced decoherence models. Okay, so this is the proposal that we came up with together with Roger Penrose, and there are many variations you can think of, but here it's a single photon put into a superposition of going in this cavity and in this cavity, and in this cavity there is a tiny mirror on a cantilever. If the photon is in this cavity and it's bouncing around with high quality mirrors, say 10 to the 6 times, it basically is a continuous force that acts on the cantilever and the initial state before the photon goes into the cavity, it would be at rest. When the photon is in the cavity, it is a constant force acting on the cantilever, so the equilibrium state would be like this, but you start like this, out of equilibrium, so you would oscillate around the equilibrium position as a result of this optical force in there. So if at this moment, when the, when the mirror makes one period of oscillation, the photon leaks out, you're back at the initial state and there's no record of whether the photon was here or in the other cavity. If the photon leaks out when the, the cantilever is displaced by more than its ground state wave packet, the photon um, would be entangled with the position of the mirror and the photon cannot interfere with itself. So the idea is that as function of the period of oscillation, we should get interference of the photon with itself and or not. And um, so that's the way we hope to, to measure um, that the photon becomes entangled with the mirror and disentangled. And once we can measure that with high accuracy, we could analyze what are the decoherence methods and change the mass of the mirror in a, in a certain way so that we can check the, the correspondence to uh, Penrose theory or, or uh, show that it's wrong. Okay, I don't have too much time anymore, so I, I will be brief on this part, which is basically a standard um, quantum mechanical calculation, so how to treat this system we come in with a, a photon along this arm, and these are just ways of making sure that we can measure both output arms from this interferometer. Here's the, the stable cavity without a small mirror on the cantilever, and here's the, the mirror on the cantilever. Um, you can write down a quantum mechanical description for this system and, and calculate that in detail, where we have the mechanical oscillator and the optical oscillator and the coupling between the mechanical and the optical field. So it's a, it's a coupled system. Uh, the coupling constant is given here, and you can um, do these calculations um, in, a, in a standard way. Okay. So we would start with a mirror in some initial coherent state of phonon excitations, right, in this way. So this initial state, this uh, coherent state of phonons is given by beta. Your initial photon will be in a superposition of going in arm A, uh, in arm B, or in arm A. Yeah? So this is your initial state of the photon and the cantilever. And then, after some time, there will be entanglement of the state of the mirror 
and um, the, the photon, except after a full period of oscillation. That's what I just explained to you. Yeah? So it's the entanglement that is turned on and off with the periodicity of the cantilever. So if there would be no decoherence at all, you would observe a decoherence invisibility of the photon. So you have to repeat your measurement many times. Out of the statistics, you conclude that after uh, a tenth of a period of oscillation, there was no interference. But uh, here you see the interference uh, revive. Now, it's important that the thermal state of your cantilever is um, in a low phonon number. So you want to be at a low temperature, as low as possible, so that this, um, this um, disappearing of the interference and the revival of the interference is uh, as pronounced as possible. It would be very hard if we only would have visibility at the tiny spike here at one period. It's much nicer if you could trace a, a cosine oscillation, if you wish. But to get that, you have to be close to the quantum ground state of your mechanical oscillator. And for the system that we just were looking at, um, at about 60 microkelvin, you have about 100 of a time in which it uh, decays and it comes back. Yeah? So you really want to go as low as possible in temperature so that you start with a clean as possible initial state of your mechanical structure. Yeah? Now, because we have to have very weak force cantilevers, um, uh, very sensitive cantilevers, we, act, we, we work at low um, frequencies and therefore to have a few pho phonons in that mode we have to be at extremely low temperatures. So we will actually aim in our experiments to get well below one microkelvin. Um, okay. Okay. Now other experimental requirements would be that you have enough force so that you displace the, the, the cantilever by more than its ground state wave packet. And that means that we have about, need to have about 10 to the fifth, so hun yeah, 100,002 million round trips in the cavity with a small mirror. The, the size of the, mirror, of the cavity is a few centimeters, and we work with about uh, a few kilohertz resonator. And those mirrors are in principle possible, um, and we, we now use those type of, of mirrors. Okay. Then there is environmental induced decoherence. As I said before, if you have a system that is coupled to the environment, there is an obvious way why interference will not show up because you entangled with the environment. In our system, the coupling to the environment is basically how the cantilever couples to its support. Yeah, the, you otherwise work at low temperatures, so there's no collisions with background gas, it's, it's a very high vacuum because you have your, your cold wall picking up all the, the, the atoms. Um, so the, the coupling of the cantilever, which determines the quality factor of the cantilever, determines the coupling strength as comes into calculation for the environment to induce decoherence. And if you do that calculation, um, you have to have your cantilever at a temperature of about a few millikelvin, and the quality should be uh, well over 100,000. So note that this is a different temperature. This is the bulk temperature of the cantilever, whereas the other temperature that I was discussing was the fundamental mode of the cantilever. So there are two different temperatures involved here. The temper effective temperature of one mode, the fundamental mode, and the, the bulk temperature of the cantilever. All right, then mechanical stability is an issue, but uh, st the stability is not more than, it, it's, it's one order better than what is used for uh, STMs. And it's, uh, similar challenges are being faced by gravitational wave detectors. So the stability is not, well, it is a major issue, but it's not out of the question that you can reach it. So we were as blunt as starting experiments by making cantilevers that would be close to what we need with, with mirrors on it. And here we, we took an atomic force microscope and cut out um, a, a tiny mirror. You see the Breck structure if you look carefully. So these are these high quality mirrors that in principle have 10 to the six uh, reflections if you have two of them. 
Um, and what we measured were mechanical qualities in the region where we wanted to be, and the optical quality was uh, 2000, which is obviously too low. And here, by cutting out such a mirror, you deposit some material on the surface, and we tried to uh, protect the surface, and um, in the end we decided that we should make the structures completely ourselves. And uh, one of my PhD students, Dustin Kleckner, uh, spent a lot of time in developing uh, such a process. And by now um, we have silicon nitride arms, which turned out to have very good quality, mechanical quality factors. And the mirror in the center is, is about uh, 40 microns and optical qualities are larger than 10,000. And in fact, just uh, two weeks ago, we got a new set of structures and they are right now being tested. Um, of course, an important question is, is there a fundamental limit of using a small mirror in a cavity? If you have a large mirror and a small mirror, what is, even if you have perfect reflecting surfaces, what is the limit? You will have some leakage of the light. So we spent quite some time, uh, again, Dustin Kleckner is the person who spent most of it um, on, on this, to simulate the effects of um, imperfections on a mirror, with a, on a cavity with one small mirror. And I won't go into the details, um, but what you basically do is you decompose um, the field in uh, the, first, the, the, the first 20 modes that you would expect if this mirror would, would be infinitely large. And then you have a, a coupling matrix from the fundamental mode into the other modes by uh, simulating the structure, taking into account that you have a finite system. And um, for each of the modes that you take into account, you have a different phase evolution when you go through the focus. And that phase evolution is characterized by the GUI phase. So if you change the length um, of the cavity, we found out that um, initially we got some, we thought the simulations were wrong. Um, you see some increase in the finesse if you, if you are around the, the, the Rayleigh lengths where the, the difference in these Kubi phases show up. And it turns out that you basically hit resonances between different modes that enhance the finesse in, in those cases. And at very short distances, there are no difference in phases, so that's why the finesse go up. And at large distances, the phases are also again the same. So this is understandable, um, and it shows us that we have a good control in calculating the finesse with small mirrors. And then you can, for example, calculate what the effect is if you're slightly defocused or if your, your cavity length is not quite right. And from that, we found that to get a finesse of 10 to the 6, what we need, we need an alignment accuracy of one nanometer at these low temperatures, which, which is uh, a serious challenge uh, experiment, experimentally. Um, and what we also found out is that the surface roughness on the large mirror, if you polish, so we, the company that makes the mirrors for LIGO are making our mirrors. They, they uh, polish the surface as good as they can and um, if you then look at the surface roughnesses, it turns out that most likely that will limit the current finesse to about 10 to the fifth, 100,000, by uh, small surface deformations on the large mirror, not on the small mirror. So we're limited by the large mirror. Now, LIGO is running into similar problems, and people who use optics in the UV because of the shorter wavelength run into these problems as well. And they have ways of actually in um, monitoring the surface and actually deposit extra materials to correct for that. So we're now trying to get involved with those companies or, well, there's, there's only, they're, they're not yet companies that, that sell this, but there's experimental expertise to get the, the curved mirror with a better quality. So I think the optics is, is under control and within reach. Um, now, what about the temperature? Okay, so in principle, with standard cooling, you can go down to 50 millikelvin. There is a, a trick, nuclear, uh, adiabatic nuclear demagnetization, that might give you below one millikelvin. And then optical cooling could be used. Here's your mirror, a small mirror with a large mirror. And in principle, if you're on the edge of a resonance and you measure the transmission, <laughs> if the, there's a little change in the cavity, you see a large change in your intensity. So you can measure the thermal motion by 
just looking of, at the light coming out of the cavity and use that to, to either with an extra laser beam uh, use light pressure to counteract that motion or modulate the field that you use to measure to counteract that. So you can um, passively cool, uh, cool the structure and um, that we did, we showed that from room temperature we could cool to 135 millikelvin in this passive cooling way. And um, I think this cooling also generated a lot of interest because it, there are many analogies with cooling atoms. Um, so many theorists became interested and other groups started building up things here. Uh, there's also a passive cooling way um, that is more directly related to, um, to atom cooling. And there um, you basically make use that there is some delay in the force, the optical force, um, with respect to the change in length because the light has a large hold time in the cavity. And that effectively can lead to cooling or heating depending on, on which side bend you are or on which side of the resonance you are. So the optical cooling can be applied on top of the standard cooling. And um, to do the standard cooling, I needed help from low temperature physics. And I remembered my days uh, as a student in Leiden um, so I went back there to discuss a design, um, and this is the type of structure that we came up with. Um, there are concrete posts, there's a large dilution refrigerator, then here is the part, uh, the dilution refrigerator should get us about 10 millikelvin, then here's this copper block that goes into a superconducting magnet um, while cooling, so that you align all the nuclear spins, and then there is a heat switch. Once you have this cold with a large magnetic field, you disconnect it from the millikelvin system. And uh, then you slowly ramp down the magnetic field. Then the spins start reorienting and that effectively lowers the temperature. It's, it's entropy cooling. Um, and that should give us a base temperature of 100 microkelvin. On top of that, we should be able to do optical cooling because the fields we need for the optical cooling and the the absorption of photons can be so low for the materials we use, we think we should be able to get close to the quantum mechanical ground state of these mechanical structures. So this is uh, a postdoc in, in Leiden working on this, and this is actually Professor Frosati, who is, is a world expert on low temperature physics. He sells half of the dilution refrigerators in the world. Um, so he's helping out with um, building this system. Um, and this is the nuclear states. Uh, some measurements, we didn't cool down to the lowest temperatures, but uh, we showed that the adiabatic nuclear states works very nicely and we should be able to get um, in the 100 micro Kelvin range with this uh, structure. Then on the optics, we've designed optical systems with graphite blocks to isolate from the 10 millikelvin system. Uh, this is connected to the uh, nuclear states. Inside we have our uh, small mirrors um, and uh, then vibration turns out to be at the moment our uh, limiting part. So we installed uh, what are called eddy current damping. There are rings of magnets with uh, copper in between and we have a double stage damping. So that is uh, included here and <coughs> At that stage, this was about September 2009, we noticed that these, the autocube systems that we were using here, that they give us uh, not enough stability, um, so we had to replace them, and that's what we uh, have built just recently. So we're right now uh, reassembling things with uh, another translation system that gives us stability and nanometer uh, accuracy, and I think with everything in place, we, we should get some very fascinating results on, on optical cooling and, and control of these, uh, these structures. Okay, and I think that's probably where I should leave it. So the people in, at UCSB who make the structures and also go to Leiden are, are Dustin Kleckner and Brian Pepper. The people in Leiden are Evan, Petro, uh, Evan Jeffrey and Petro uh, Sonen. And, uh, everything is made by the machine shop in Leiden uh, by a technician dedicated to this project, Harmon. Yeah. So thank you for your attention. Questions from
Or um, this makes me think of the, the Schrodinger Newton equation, where you also seem to have a nonlinear term added to the, the Schrodinger equation, I think, right? And there were some uh, other uh, earlier theories where there were some nonlinear terms added to Schrodinger's equation that I think, you know, Anton Seidinger tested a long time ago and put some limits on. So I think I might understand correctly that what you're doing is looking at uh, getting decoherence time close to kind of evolution time and looking at an other manifestation of something that might also, you know, limit the extent of the wave functions inside of it. If that's the case, are there already limits on that type of theory? So, I, I think the, the limits on superpositions Experimentally, are these C60 atoms, and recently these experiments from UCSB with these high frequency resonators. Um, I'm not, not familiar, too familiar with these nonlinear models and what they predict and what experiments would be ideally to test those. I'm not sure if, if you would be looking for decoherence mechanisms or whether you would be looking in the coherent evolution in deviations from it. I think that would be probably a better approach and that's probably the type of experiments they did. So decoherence is, is a separate issue. It might be that these nonlinear models also play a, play a role there. Um, uh, and there are other people who have proposed that gravitational effects play a role in, in decoherence. And in fact, uh, Dioji uh, is one of them who basically just on, on he said, what if this is the situation, I have a superposition, I want to get something out of the term of an energy. And only that he used as motivation and came up with exactly the same equation. And then used delta E, delta T is of the order of H bar. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite natural. Yeah. And, uh, and personally I'm convinced that there is something deep when you talk about superposition of m uh, massive objects. Um, it's not a clean theory, not at all at the moment. I have two questions. The first, which I've heard you talk in earlier times about this, but haven't ever been able to figure out, is do you believe that your experiments, when they finally seem to be in the right regime, will show quantum mechanics correct or not correct? If I believe, I am... Agnostic. <laughs> yes. Um, I think both would be spectacular. If this, if I, this shows that for larger masses, I, we still see perfect interference, I'm going to ask Lev Feitman how expensive his watch is. Um, <laughs> so, <coughs> or, or, or maybe get some stocks in his company. Because if this really, if we keep pushing the boundary and we keep showing that quantum mechanics is just right on target with massive or more massive, massive objects, then if I take a single photon source and I blow it up to this macroscopic superposition, both are there. It's the same material, um, but, and we don't come across such cases often in real life that there is a true quantum feature making decisions for us. It's only recently that we can do experiments with individual quantum particles that we put in superpositions. Um, you might think maybe there is something, uh, it's something, a uh, toy model, and I don't know, probably people have published that already, but um, there are cases in evolution for example, DNA mutations, it's an, some, some high energy particle hitting the DNA, making a mutation. So it could have hit, the superposition of the wave could have hit, made different mutations. So currently it's a big debate, how was evolution so efficient on Earth? If you try to mimic uh, evolution in a classical statistical way, it's catastrophe after one after another. It's very hard to have a constructive evolution. So if different evolutions took place, then obviously we are now experiencing uh, one of the successful branches of the many worlds. Um, but That's an opinion. <laughs> That's an opinion. Well, it would also explain... Well, no, that was a good opinion. <laughs> this is, this is right. if you try to think what, what it means if we keep seeing superposition after superpositions by doing a single particle in a superposition, doing two different things, you could ask, where did it happen before? Sure. Yeah. Now, but uh, the, the other question, the first uh, prefaced by uh, my admiration for uh, your loyalty and your dedication to the project and your really strong uh, 
mental energy to keep going, and, and I know all of the practical difficulties from money to equipment and so on. But it does seem to me that the thousand-fold, uh, I forget whether it was 100, 100 microkelvin to 100 nanokelvin required, mm -hmm. is uh, like that cartoon where you, there's a big question mark. And one theorist is pointing to the question mark and saying to the other, this seems, oh, it says, and then a miracle occurs, or something like that. Yeah, it's but a Larson cartoon. It's a cartoon, right? Larson. No, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yes. so, uh, yeah. Wherever, uh, anyways, in New York or Harris. Sydney Harris, right? Harris. But um, yeah. knowing you, I don't believe that it's quite that bad, but it did seem like that's kind of hoping because you're counting on what optical cooling of a massive object in a way. Wasn't that the optical stage when you went? We, we have been, we demonstrated optical cooling by four orders of magnitude. Yeah. We know that if there is one photon absorbed when we, so we know that we can get to under 100 microkelvin with standard cooling. With there's the yes. magnetization. Yes. yes. Yeah. And there are some issues with how to actually efficiently cool through these little leads. Yeah, yeah. But oh. you could use additional optical cooling to help to getting to the temperature. Okay. So, but you could get there. Then you can calculate how much intensity you need to do the optical cooling from there. And what are the materials? What are your f optical losses? What is the chance to absorb a photon? And you can uh, fairly simple calculate that you shouldn't be too worried that you can go to 100 nanokelvin. In the meantime, what is so exciting, uh, slightly worried, worrying, but it's about science, it's exciting that there are so many new groups right now. There are yeah. few places, few universities that have been hiring people, but it's all been in optomechanics. Um, so there's a, there, there was another, uh, the second Gordon conference was a few weeks ago, and it's huge. In Europe, we started three years ago a small consortium of, of five, six groups, and there was a call to add a few new groups, and we came with a list of 15 new groups within two years, including Peter Zoller, Ignacio Chirac, uh, Milburn. I mean, yeah, good, people. good people. Yeah. They are now thinking of using mechanical structures as part of the quantum family. We have photons, atoms, ions, neutrons, and mechanical structures. So this work is, is not, this is just gonna continue. And someone, I hope it's people in my group, and in not too far future will show superpositions of larger and larger objects, and in fact that already happened recently with a, a huge jump in the mass of an object that has been properly demonstrated to be in a superposition, the experiments by Andrew Cleland earlier. Uh, they used um, a piezo-driven oscillator in, in the gigahertz and coupled them to the superconducting qubits where they can very nicely add a single phonon to such a structure. And he demonstrated that they see a superposition of zero and one phonon. And they do these experiments also with microwave cavities, but because the, the quality factors, the mechanical quality factors are so poor, it's very hard to push that further. So I was surprised that he said, we've worked for this for seven years and that's where we stop now. But that, that was a, a big jump and again, there are also now theory proposals that tell, tell us you don't have to go all the way to the ground state. Um, there are also correlations you can look at if you combine with other fields, do some homodyne uh, measurements. So there's a lot of development and quantum superpositions of larger and larger objects will be tested the coming few years and continue to uh, go to larger and larger uh, masses. And then once they start seeing deviations, it's very interesting that the, the decoherence that Penrose predicts is not just an exponential decoherence. It really depends very much on um, the masses and how far you uh, uh, put them apart. If you calculate the self-energy, you need about half of it to get the displacement of the ground state wave packet. And if you move it further, it doesn't change at all. Whereas most theories, they, this distance comes into play because that will be how easy can a, an external wave distinguish the two? So the standard decoherence models will give you a different, um, yeah, yeah, so you, there's a systematic way to start hunting for this effect. Rob, did you have a question? No, okay, uh, but that's much more technical, because uh, only, <coughs> I think it's clear you're working with, electromag with electromagnetic waves and there, 
the momentum transfer is very small, it's little. Yeah. Uh, has one considered to use massive particles uh, for such experiments? Because, for instance, you can get also good resonators, like I say it for neutrons, when you reflect them between black planes back and forth yeah. many, many times. So that, uh, but uh, is there a special re reason to do it just with photons? No, no not at all. Momentum transfer is so small. Yeah, no, that, that's. Um, that's why the people with the superconducting qubits, that's, that's a different excitation mechanism. You, um, and um, if you want to do these experiments, people are trying to get BECs in super, superpositions with more and more atoms. They've, of course, already demonstrated that, but the number of atoms was not, not so large. Um, so they can blow that up. Neutron experiments, if you can store and, and, and have one of the mirrors small enough so that you have a, a small mass that can be displaced, that it's, it's for any quantum system you can uh, come up with a, a related experiment. Yeah. It's just in optics that a lot of people in the past have done some high sensitive measurements that I'm, I'm staying in optics for now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I mean, it would be a fantastic experiment to do this, and I, and I agree that it, it's really wonderful to push you know, the concept of coherence to larger and larger masses. But it is a little curious because you're only coupling with a single photon, and so that these two coherent macroscopic states, if you will, are almost exactly in the same place. It would be like having two Schrodinger's cats that were one Planck length apart. So in some sense, it's, it's not like a bowling ball being diffracted through Double slit. No, no, no. That's this is the first step you you would take, um, and um, what you do, you get your macroscopic object in a distinguishable state. So if you could do a measurement on it, you could say it is this state or that state. Um, it doesn't. You can distinguish a, a, a tennis ball from here being here and there quite easily. So it is in that sense a superposition. Um, but if you could isolate it further, and if you could have a larger arm, uh, yeah, you could think of scaling it up so that you could actually uh, a displacement larger than the size of your object. Um, you could also, um, that's uh, another variety that people come up with lately, have a very thin film that is between two large mirrors, and that's your moving membrane. Or we actually were thinking ourselves to have the, 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 the top uh, layer of your mirror disconnected from the rest, and that one will move. So if you have just, a f in theory, a few atoms thin slide, but that is large and still massive, then you might get displacements of the size. You still cannot see it with your eye, but uh, it's a displacement by the size of the system. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah I just wanted to uh, add that there are other um, modifications of the Schrodinger equation that induce a stochastic collapse of the wave function at random times, and the rate of collapse uh, is uh, proportional to the mass of the wave packet that you're considering. So these types of models are going to the heading of uh, GRW or spontaneous uh, localization models. Right, but what, what is, do they have a physical reason why these fluctuations would take place? So these fluctuations are just sort of put into the yeah. model, right? And they lead to a dynamical collapse mechanism yeah. that but, but, does reproduce yeah. the predictions of quantum mechanics to uh, within current experimental limits. But I'm thinking that if you can create quantum superpositions with mirrors and mechanical devices of very large masses, you might even be able to uh, test the predicted uh, stochastic collapse of these particular models as well. But, when Penrose talks about these things, he al always refers to all the other models, but he, he always says, well, my model, there's some reason for it. Uh, he really has a, a mechanism in mind, uh, gravitational induced, uh, rather than introducing uh, something from a different, uh, a complete different theory. Yeah, well, this is also, you need additional theory as well. So. I think there's maybe also an essential difference is Penrose trying to claim that uh, Gravitational self-energy self can solve the measurement problem, the quantum measurement problem. Mm -hmm. 
they see making that additional claim because these stochastic collapse models they right. explicitly intend to explain why we see one particular eigenvalue corresponding to one eigenstate. Right. In right. No, that, that's that's not here. He just it, it's argued that the superposition cannot persist. The question is, if it cannot persist, if you try to put it in the superposition, what happens then? And that it what happens is that it's one or the other. It's it's reasonable because those are the only stable classical states. Um, so there, is, there are additional arguments why, if it cannot be in a superposition, those two are the possible alternatives and nothing else, and not a superposition of the two per persisting. Yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, let's take your last question. Oh, well, this, just a comment on this last thing, that Penrose, while Penrose can make his uh, argument sound very reasonable, um, he does. He is making a, an assumption that, uh, basically, assuming that you can't just get a superposition of space times, because if if the whole space time is treated quantum mechanically, then well, okay, you have superposition of different masses. Fine, you have a superposition of different metrics, um, and there isn't inherently anything wrong with that. You have to make some additional assumption right, but that's, that gravity is separate from everything else. That's why I started my talk with this brief overview of twister theory, because that's where his real arguments are hidden. Right. And he never has time, or, or it, it, I don't have time. I, I understand it a little bit, and I, I think there's something deep there. And if, if, I, if, if you look at some of his articles, he says, twister theory to him is like Hamilton formalism uh, that was developed well before physicists used it to, uh, to in quantum mechanics, and he thinks that twister theory is a, will play a similar role in, in in future theory of general relativity and quantum mechanics. Um, and there are so many beautiful things in there; uh, it's it's fantastic. But it didn't come to one theory, and uh, it might. Yeah. Thank you again, Dick Foster.